to welcome uh, Curtis uh, for his presentation of testing PAM4 signaling for 10 base T1 automotive Ethernet. And uh, Curtis, I think, was also very early involved in all the automotive Ethernet development, first at UNH and now he's moved to Rhoda and Schweiz to give his presentation on this topic. So welcome, Curtis. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thank you very much, Kirsten, for the introduction. Uh, helped me break the ice a little bit on uh, my change of employment. But um, as you indicated, I've been very involved with um, automotive Ethernet in general for many years, Open Alliance, IEEE. So it's great to see everybody here again. Um, and uh, I hope my presentation is a bit less controversial than uh, Jamila's to topics. So. There we go. Um, so when I was piecing together this presentation, the slide deck, it became very clear to me that I was gonna have to reduce the scope of my topics given only a 30 minute time frame, and uh, I don't wanna uh, cut into our lunch time either. So um, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the, um, how, how we got to where we are with auto automotive ethernet today, a little bit of the, uh, a history lesson, stepping through the IEEE process and then looking at specifically the electrical PMA specification for 10G base T1 and even more detailed going into the deterministic jitter and the linearity and distortion test cases, kind of focusing on the parameters that have changed since 1000 base T1, looking at the 10 gigabit and then a brief summary. So, um, a couple of presentations ago, we actually saw some very similar data from uh, Mabood's slide set, but uh, here I just kind of give a brief uh, timeline of how the IEEE has adopted automotive ethernet into their specifications, uh, dating back to mid 2012 or so, when they started developing 1000 base T1. Um, if you've followed the IEEE, uh, you know that they didn't start with the lowest speed and, and increase from there. They kind of hopped around a little bit. Um, but this just kind of gives you an idea of how long it takes for one of these specifications to be completed within the IEEE. There's a lot of people that don't attend those meetings ask the questions, you know, how quickly can a specification be created? And I'd say on average, about three years is, uh, uh, three plus years is what mo most of these projects took. And again, Mabood had a very similar slide, a very si si similar table uh, describing the different automotive ethernet clauses within the IEEE. So I thought this was a nice summary kind of indicating the uh, differences in the bandwidth requirements for the specifications, looking at the, the line encoding from two level DME to PAM4, which is what I'll be talking about for the most part today. And the, the, the different type of, uh, um, medium used, either UTP or STP. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on the slide is that because of the jump in bandwidth requirements from each of the technologies, specifically from 1000 base T1, which had a, um, a baud rate of 750 megahertz or, a, a, uh, sorry, me megabaud or a Nyquist rate of 375 megahertz, going up to uh, 5.6 gigabaud for 10G base T1, it requires in most cases, new equipment, new higher bandwidth requirements typically ju justify um, needing new oscilloscopes, new network analyzers. Um, so that kind of gets brought up in the test setups that I'll be describing in a few, few slides. Um, as I mentioned on the last slide, one of the changes between all of the technologies is the line encoding. And uh, just as a brief intro as to why you would consider changing the line encoding, why not just keep it static for all the technologies? It basically comes down to bandwidth. There's a lot of considerations taken into account during these IEEE projects. Um, cable reach, um, the amount of noise allowed in the channel, but really the answer kind of comes down, it boils down to the allowable bandwidth. And I have a, an, a copy paste of a table here from a, a NXP contribution during the 802.3CH specification development, kind of showing if you, um, what the Nyquist rate would be for each of the line encodings to maintain a 10 gigabit 
link. So you can see if you've used a two voltage level system like PAM2, uh, you would require a ni Nyquist weight up to 5.6 gigahertz, but jumping to something like 16 voltage levels PAM16, you could significantly reduce that to 1.4 gigahertz. So basically what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that for the number of voltage levels, as they increase, you also increase the number of uh, bits interpreted by that symbol in which you also get the benefit of a lowered Nyquist rate, but you also lower your SNR, so your signal to, to noise ratio. So there is a trade-off that you have to uh, consider there. So that's why for 10G base T1, PAM4 was, was chosen it, between all the factors that the IEEE went through. That was the, uh, the line coding that they chose. So now stepping into clause 149, I'm going to be talking specifically about the PMA, the um, physical me medium attachment sublayer within the IEEE clause definitions, and that's where the electrical parameters are, are defined. So the Open Alliance has created TC15 to create the test specification for the PMA electrical testing, just like they did for 1000 base T1 with TC12 and uh, TC1 for 100 base T1. The scope-based measurements I have listed on the left side here, there's droop, linearity, jitter, PSD, output, um, a amplitude, and clock frequency. Um, these are, for the most part, very similar to the previous Ethernet FIs, but there are some, some changes. And uh, for the purposes of today's presentation, to not take up too much time, I will not be discussing the test cases written in red. Um, Squidward here is not impressed with these test cases because they re they're relatively unchanged from earlier Ethernet um, FIs. So I'm going to be focusing more on the transmitter linearity and the transmitter timing jitter. These are a bit more interesting because they're unique to MG base T1, to 2.5 and 10 gig, and not the same compared to 1000 base T1. So when looking at the jitter parameters, for 10G base T1, there's actually five unique uh, test cases looking at different types of jitter, different modes of the transmitter. But again, due to the timing constraints of today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on only two of them, or sorry, only one of them, the deterministic jitter. Um, master mode, slave mode, and the random jitter are relatively unchanged compared to 100 base T1 and 1000 base T1. These are both, uh, or the, these are all still time interval error or TIE based me measurements that are done on uh, two vol voltage level test patterns. So deterministic jitter and even odd jitter are unique to 10G base T1. Um, they're, they've been adopted from other IEEE clauses that also use PAM fork encoding, but not seen in earlier automotive ethernet um, implementations. And Again, just because of timing, deterministic jitter is what I'm going to be focusing on the next couple of slides. EOJ is something we'll have to come back to in a different presentation. Um, this slide is a bit boring. This is a copy-paste of the procedure within the IEEE that defines the deterministic jitter procedure. Um, the reason I have it here is because I just kind of want to point out that because Clause 149, the 802.3CH project, adopted PAM4, they ended up looking at other PAM4 technologies within the IEEE for um, inspiration of their um, electrical parameters. And this was one of them that they adopted from, I think, Clause 85, which is one of the 25 gigabit technologies <clears throat> within the IEEE. So that is a uh, CERTES-based technology different set of engineers within the IEEE 802.3 group were defining these, um, these clauses, but because of the shared line coding, they adopted the deterministic jitter. Um, I boil it down to a very few s simple plots here. Essentially, um, for 10G base T1, you're measuring a sine wave test pattern with a fre frequency of 2.8 gigahertz. You get the error, um, sorry, the, the, the zero crossing to create the uh, jitter series of that test pattern. You apply a filter that's described in the procedures on a few slides 
ago, and then you turn that into a cumulative density function of CDF, and you get the J6, J5 parameters from that um, equation, which is all defined within the IEEE. So very post-processing heavy um, procedure, not something that can be done explicitly on the oscilloscope. You can't just click a button to, um, to look at a, a math function to do this. This relies on exporting the data, processing it, and calculating these values. So next I'm going to talk about uh, the linearity distortion parameter, which has changed significantly between uh, 100, 1000 base T1, and 10, 10 G base T1. This test case exists between all of the um, Ethernet technologies, but it has evolved over time. So with the exception of the half duplex mode for 10, G, uh, 10 base T1, all of the automotive Ethernet FIs um, have a full duplex operation across a single pair of conductors. This isn't surprising to anybody. Um, but that means that on that one link, there are two distinct transmit si signals combining on the, uh, the copper. So the transmitter distortion tests were used for several um, e -E Ethernet technologies, not just automotive, to quantify the linearity of the FIs uh, transmitter implementation because with the two, two vo voltages combined, there's going to be some distortion included in the, the measured pattern. So this, these diagrams here are the test setups that were um, created for Clause 96 for 100 base T1. The left-hand side is a direct copy out of the IEEE, their example of test fixture 2 for the distortion test. On the right-hand side, this is uh, a diagram from the Open Alliance kind of demonstrating the pieces of equipment used to make this measurement. So you see there's, there's a, an oscilloscope, there's, the, of course, the device under test, but then you also have this disturber generator that's, in this case, generating a 11.111 megahertz sine wave that's injected into the, um, the port of the DUT. And in addition to all that, you need all three pieces of equipment, the, the oscilloscope, the uh, disturber generator, and the device under test, all uh, connected to the same reference clock. So there was an, a, a fourth uh, component needed that uh, Rodian Schwartz developed as the frequency converter board, and that connected all of the clock domains together. A very complicated test, um, and over the years, it's something that's generated a lot of comments and uh, discomfort within the test and measurement community because if you don't have all of these components together, you automatically set yourself up for failure. Uh, without the um, reference clock um, tied together for all pieces of equipment, your distortion values are by default gonna be increased. So during the development for, of 802.3CH, they examined um, that test setup. I, I actually gave a presentation uh, looking at 100 base T1 and 1000 base T1 devices tested at the University of New Hampshire um, against any bit error, um, or sorry, any interoperability failures against distortion fit failures. And due to that presentation and a few other contributing ar articles, it was decided that um, the injection approach of, of adding the disturber was no longer necessary for um, automotive ethernet. The, due to ch changes in the, the Phi architecture, um, the silicon vendors agreed that it would, it would be adequate to change this test setup. So they, instead they adopted the SNDR approach, uh, again, from another high-speed 25 gigabit Surtees technology, and it's much simpler. Here, we just have the device under test connected directly to the oscilloscope. There's no um, disturber signal needed. There's no reference board to tie all the clock domains together. Just two pieces of equipment, the device and the scope. Um, so what is SNDR? Signal to noise distortion ratio is, is what it stands for. And it's calculated with this equation. Again, it's from, uh, you, you can find this within the IEEE. 
there's three main components to actually uh, determine what your S and DR value is, which is a dB value. There's Pmax, which is the peak of the linear fit pulse response. So again, this is another uh, test parameter that has a lot of post-processing involved where um, you capture a PRBS 13Q test pattern, which is just a pseudo-random PAM4 sequence. Uh, the device is transmitting it. It repeats every 8,191 symbols. That's what makes it pseudo-random. So you, you capture that. And then from there, you compare that to an ideal transmission of that test pattern. And feeding it through a few algorithms, you get the Pmax, sigma e, and sigma n. Um, sigma e represents the distortion of the pattern, and sigma n is the, the noise, the RMS de deviation. So that's how you get the signal to noise and distortion ratio. Um, here I have a couple diagrams of what, um, of representing those three parameters. The Pmax and the sigma e are um, very sensitive to averaging. So it's not explicitly explained within the IEEE. There are some vague definitions, um, but there, the, this test case is very sensitive to how the, 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 the data is collected, the way it's, it's filtered or, or manipulated in the post-processing, and um, these steps are being considered within the Open Alliance. Rodi and Schwartz is actually making a, a proposal for a more standardized approach to, to how to make this measurement. Um, but essentially, the distortion or sigma e is the, um, after averaging the me measured pattern and then comparing it against the ideal signal, the deviations in the ideal versus the um, entire pattern. The noise, the RMS deviation, cannot be measured on an average signal. This has to be accumulated over several um, captures of the previous 13Q. And in the diagram I have on the right, that's an overlay of um, the specific sections of the test pattern where the uh, noise parameter is defined to be measured. The red uh, stars or the, what they look like lines because they're so many overlaid on top of one another are the um, six symbol VAT values within that run of consecutive symbols. And that's where the noise VAT values are uh, me measured from and then doing a, hi a histogram on the right hand side of that. So um, here we used a one millisecond capture, which is roughly 680 um, uh, measurements of the PRBS 13Q pattern. That's why I have them overlaid like that. And the noise parameter is, is collected from those measurements, excuse me. Um, like I said, the Open Alliance is um, considering a more specific detailed approach to how to make these measurements since they're so sensitive to the bandwidth used, the sampling rate, there's um, some minimum requirements that are recommended from that, I believe. Yes, so here's my summary, like I said, short and sweet presentation on 10G base T1, but over the last 10 years, the IEEE has been developing um, automotive Ethernet five specifications. The most recent is 10G base T1, but there's already some developments for beyond 10G gig as well. Um, the Open Alliance is creating test specifications for these, these uh, or continuing to create test specifications for these Ethernet types. Um, 10G base T1 introduced some new electrical parameters, which requires new equipment, higher bandwidths and such, and then the uh, reduction of the difficulty in the distortion test using the SNDR approach. Um, I think I'm just under my time. Very good. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So I have a good. Dis uh, I have a question to you. Um, you know, it's always this discussion of getting to higher data rates and higher data rates. And um, you are now saying, okay, th um, these are the difference now that we're seeing from going from PAM two to PAM four. How far do you think it makes sense to go in order to increase single pair data rates? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and. Um, I don't know I have a great answer for you, but it, like I said, there's many considerations that need to be accounted for when, when looking at 
um, these technologies. Um, if we look a, a, a history lesson of other Ethernet phi types, um, the original copper 10 gig, 10 G base T, that actually used PAM 16 encoding. So the IEEE has had other Ethernet types that do go beyond four voltage levels. Um, there's that, that, phi t that phi technology was very power hungry, so it wasn't well adopted, and that's why um, there's um, the, the CERTES groups kind of grew from there to, to look at the higher band rates, uh, uh, baud rates. But um, it all depends on the reach and what we as an industry are willing to accept for noise conditions. Um, Jamila and Michael's presentation on EMC um, kind of gives a little bit of a clue as to um, how much bandwidth we can keep pushing through copper and, and what could be acceptable in the car environment. So um, there's a lot of things that we could continue looking at, but I, I think long reach solutions uh, may have to look, look at new ar architecture types for ethernet. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anybody at the queue at the back. I, there are no questions online. And with that, I think uh, we just keep it short in order to be able to have a lunch right now. So thank you very much once more, Curtis.